Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends. Welcome to today's event, part of the Visiting Artist Program of the Center for Hellenic Studies. This program facilitates exchange between arts practitioners and researchers and supports contemporary artistic responses to ancient Greek culture. I'm delighted to introduce uh, visiting artist Ellen McLaughlin, who joins us in person from our campus here in Washington, D.C. Ellen McLaughlin has worked extensively in regional, international, and New York theater, both as an actor and as a playwright. Ellen's acting work includes originating the part of the angel in Angels in America, playing the role in workshops and regional productions through its original Broadway run. Her plays have been produced off Broadway regionally and internationally. She is the recipient of the Writers Award from the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund, as well as other honors, including the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize, the Alan Merrill Award for Playwriting, and grants from the ENA. Plays and operas include Tang of a, uh, Tongue of a Bird, Iphigenia and Other Daughters, The Persians, Penelope, Ajax in Iraq, Septimus and Clarissa, Blood Moon, and the Orstaya. Producers include the Public Theater, National Actors Theater, Classical Stage Company, New York Theater Workshop, The Guthrie, The Intiman, The Mark Taper Forum, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Actors Theatre of Louisville, Shakespeare Theatre in DC, Prototype, and the Almeida Theatre in London. She has taught in several programs, including Yale School of Drama, Princeton, and Bradloaf School of English. She has taught playwriting at Barnard College since 1995. Today's presentation, titled Working with a Fragment, with the Fragments, a Playwright's Perspective, addresses the challenge of working as a playwright with fragments, often mere splinters of lost plays. Ellen will speak specifically about the process of working with a fragment of Euripides Protesilos, which she, has com she was commissioned by Classic Stage Company in New York City to turn into a full-length play. Dear Ellen, welcome. Thank you. I've spent the last two weeks at the Center for Hellenic Studies looking through fragments of lost plays. Given the paltriness of what has survived, tiny snippets of sentences, mere bits of meaning in so many cases, we can only guess at whatever these plays must once have been. Even if we know the basic plots from the myths, often we have no idea how the plays were constructed, what their casts of characters were, or how they worked on their audiences. And what I've felt more than anything is an aching sense of loss for all that we don't have, which is to say the vast majority of the literature of antiquity. Somehow the reality of that has never been borne in upon me as palpably as it has been during these days I've spent sifting through the rubble. Perhaps it's because the time I've been a resident here has coincided with the assault on Ukraine and the images that are coming out of that country a single boot distinct in a mess of wreckage, or a teacup strangely intact resting atop a wave of ruin. It's been, it is a time of cherishing the fragments, the random, the arbitrary, the survivors of the maelstrom. Each sliver takes on an aura, a poignance, a dignity. Just to give you an idea, Here's a fragment from an edition of Euripides' Lost Plays translated and compiled by Christopher Collard and Martin Kropp. It's among the largest of the fragments from a play that's based on the story of Oedipus. It's from what seems to be a description of the Sphinx. Locks of her hair, curling her tail beneath her lion's legs and feet, she sat down, dot, 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 putting away her swift flying, in time, dot, 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 she, dot, 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 of leafy foliage, dot, 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 so as to, dot, 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 as if to hold, dot, 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 her wing to the rays, 
If the creature held her winged back toward the sun's horses, its hue was golden. And if towards the cloud, like a rainbow, it shone back a dark blue gleam. And here's a mysterious tease of a fragment. And the reed, which is the maker of a song that the black river swells to ripeness, the intricate skill of the nightingale, her pipes sweetly blown. That's it. How can we not long to know this in its entirety? How can we not mourn the loss of whatever this must have been? Now, I know that in experiencing this sense of grief, I join the ranks of every classicist who's ever lived, since it seems to me that classicists are always dealing with shards, with nimbus, with implication, the broken, the unguessable, the unrecoverable. And <clears throat> surely as a dramatist, I should be taking comfort for what has survived of the countless lots, seven by Aeschylus, seven by Sophocles, and by a fluke, 18 by Euripides. Though we know that there were once literally hundreds of plays written by just these three playwrights alone, still, still, what we do have is miraculous, improbable really, given how wondrously old it all is. And tiny though it is in relation to what is gone, what has survived has justifiably astonished and captivated the mind and spirit of Western civilization. An intact teacup aloft on a sea of ruin from which we interpret and intuit the world. Which is why as a playwright, I feel that when I adapt Greek plays, I am not doing anything all that different from what the Greeks were doing. They took up the myths of their own ancients and made new narrative holes out of the sometimes broken and contradictory stories that had come down to them, shifting and resorting the pieces to make sense of their own moment. And fragments which are elusive and provocative sometimes work better for such purposes than what is unassailable and already monumentally complete because what is fragmentary demands the aid of the writer's imagination. Which is why I wanted to spend this time talking about a play I wrote based on a fragment. In the spring of, 19, uh, of <laughs> 2015, I was asked by Brian Kulik, then artistic director of Classic Stage Company in New York, to participate in what he was calling the Fragments Project. He asked three playwrights to write full-length plays inspired by fragments of lost plays. The one he offered me was Euripides Protosileus, of which we have very little indeed, amounting to, in all to a mere page or so. And most of the dialogue is difficult even to attribute to any particular characters. But of course, we know the myth, which involves a, the titular character Protosileus, the Thessalian commander whose story appears in Book Two of the Iliad. Robert Fagels translates the passage as the veteran Protosileus had led these troops while he lived, but now for many years, the arms of the black earth had held him fast and his wife was left behind, alone in Philaki, both cheeks torn with grief, their house half built. Just as he vaulted off his ship, a Dardan killed him, first by far of the Argives slaughtered on the beaches. The Euripides play seems to mostly concern the aftermath of Protosileus' death and is taken up with his young wife, Laudania, she of the cheeks torn in her mourning, who enjoyed only a day of marriage before Protosileus was conscripted away from her and her half-built house to lead his countrymen to Troy. All versions of the story include an almost unprecedented event, the temporary return of a dead person to the upper world. In mine, it's Laudemia's grief that is so outsized and unrelenting that the gods uncharacteristically take pity on her and allow Protosileus to return from the underworld, but only briefly before he is recalled to death forever. In most versions of the story, it's the second irrevocable loss that spurs Laudemia to commit suicide. I was intrigued, but when I heard that it was apparently this myth that inspired Thornton Wilder to write the classic American play, Our Town, I was hooked. From our earliest contemplation of that all too understandable desire to bring loved ones back from the dead, there has also been something uncanny 
and worrisome about the thought of any actual realization of that desire. The Greeks are always unsettled by the implications of it. One has only to think of a mute and veiled returned, but somehow still absent at the end of her play to know that there's something fundamentally wrong about the attempt, even if it succeeds. It may be that Orpheus turns to lose Eurydice back to the myths of death because he senses this. Perhaps it's not that he doubts she is behind him, but that he has misgivings about whether she should be. There are versions of the myth in which there was a prophecy that the first to get off the boats at Troy would be the first to die in Troy. This led me to wonder about why he might have knowingly sacrificed his life and whether it could be likened to Iphigenia's decision to give up her own in Iphigenia and all this. Was his decision linked like hers to a sense of duty to the workings and needs of history? Did he sacrifice his life from a sense that we individuals, of what we individuals owe to the greater story, which by its grandeur should take precedence over our own singular story? And the poignant notion of the character who is the first to die in a war led me to want as a dramatist to contrast him with the character who's the last to die in a war. I call him Telefteos, for two such soldiers are the children birthed by every war that has ever been. I wanted to give them a chance to converse with each other in the underworld and compare their fates. Protosuleus asks Telefteus how he died, and Telefteus says that he was the last to climb out of the Trojan horse. As he was descending, he suddenly thought of the scent of his wife's neck, and in that moment of distraction, he lost his footing on the rope ladder. He fell and lay unnoticed as his comrades ran off and out into the city that last terrible night of the war. He says, I died, the last of the Greeks, a nobody left behind in a heap and forgotten. There was too much to do that night to remember me. Now to help me read a few scenes from the play, I'm bringing in a ringer, my husband, Rindy Eckert, who in this case will read Protosileus and I will read Telefteus. After Telefteus tells this story, Protosileus says, Does she know? My wife? I don't know. I hate to think of it. It brought happiness to us, marriage, though we didn't have long not even time enough to make a baby in her. Us neither. The war snapped its jaws and that was it for us. I wish I'd looked at her harder. I'd have more to remember. But we were shy of each other, always glancing away as if there was time. We thought there would be all the years to know each other, the sweetness of the bed. It wasn't big, but it was mine, that story. And I'll take my little one over your big one any day. It's not mine. It's everybody's. And we need the big stories. They give us something more than our own circle of hills to think about. We can lift our eyes and dream of greatness. It was just a war. And it was only a bigger story because stories live by their endings. And that had thousands, death upon death upon death. But always a first and a last which is where we come in. You and me, it was our fate. Who can say which of us was the most unlucky? I can, I was, it was a long war and there wasn't a day that I didn't want it to be over. But I died before I got to do anything. You had a chance at glory. No, the glory was all yours. You died for history or I don't know, something. You were the first, so your death had meaning. After that, it was all just a bloody blur for the rest of us. The only person my death will matter to is my wife. You got to be part of the big story. You got heroism. The likes of me just got on with finishing what you started. It didn't feel particularly heroic. It felt more like impatience. Do we need to start that again?
Do we know when it stopped? Just now. Just now, no. We'll go back a little bit. Why don't you say you had a chance at glory? <clears throat> you had a chance at glory. No, the glory was all yours. You died for history or I don't know, something. You were the first. So your death had meaning. After that, it was all just a bloody blur for the most of us. The only person my death will matter to is my wife. You got to be part of the big story. You got heroism. The likes of me just got on with finishing what you started. Didn't feel particularly heroic. Felt more like impatience. And wanted to get it over with, whatever it was. Anyway, I couldn't help myself. Before I knew what I was doing, I, I had put one leg over the side and the other was following it. And I found myself sliding down into the shallow waves. That's when I looked up at the sky and saw the arrows arcing toward me. I knew I wouldn't even make the beach. The war would begin and end for me right there, yards from the shore my own blood circling me in the water as I went down. I thought, look what I have begun just by getting off a boat, everything. And then I was dead. And when did you remember her? Too late, too late. And now it's all I do, remember her. Everything else has lost its color. She's all I've got. And there's not much, a handful of memories, a few bright days. All the little stories that never got to happen. That's the thing about the big stories. They always eat the little ones. You never get used to it, the dark down here. I wonder. Yes. Me too. If they think of us. And what they remember. Her neck. Her mouth. Her eyes opening as she wakes. Turning her wrist as she stretches towards ceiling. A yawn. Then a smile. Looking out at the day. The day that hasn't happened yet. Just an ordinary day. The day we can't help but begin. All of it before us. The day we are about to live out together. The light. The light. The scene ends with them both looking up. I knew I wanted a presiding deity for the play. In the Euripides fragment, Hermes has one line, just follow me as I guide you. So I presumed Euripides felt as I do that he, or in my version, Mercury is the obvious candidate. His relationship with humans is so much more intimate than any other deities because he is the one who takes us, each of us down the path to the underworld and so spends much more time in human company than any other God. He knows something about how we suffer, how we love. It is that essential affinity for the mortal that made me feel that the play belongs to him. Here's how I introduce him. Mercury enters, he's in silver gray, wearing his characteristic winged helmet and sandals. He carries in one hand several long gray silk ribbons which trail behind him. He's entirely comfortable speaking to the audience. This is, as far as he's concerned, his play. Yes, uh, I am that one, the one who takes you down to the underworld. It's a good job, not without interest. I hear a lot of stories. The long walk down the gray corridor to the shore is almost never a quiet journey. The compulsion you all have to talk, your memories, your regrets, pain and joy, babbled childhood rhymes, snatches of song, last minute attempts to assemble a theory about what it all meant, the life you just had, as the pinprick of light at our backs gets smaller and smaller. All the talk. I hear it all spooling out behind me as we travel deeper and deeper 
away from the sun and down to the damp mist rising up the passage from the river shore below. Centuries upon centuries now, I've listened to you all, the tiny knots and snarls and snapped threads of ordinary existence. Because most human lives, well, it's just stepping on the rake, losing that bracelet. The dog wanders off, it rains on the ball game. A poorly aimed arrow here, a house burned down there, Oopsie daisy, coughs and bruises, bee stings and cancer, night falls before your home safely, the dropped match is still lit, someone leaves the cage door open by mistake, and death. Death, death, death. And that's where I come in. I am the god of endings. Unassuageable grief is disturbing for all of us, gods and men alike. There is an implicit sense in most societies that there is a term of grief that really should come to an end eventually. After one moves through its phase, stages, observing all the rituals and protocols of any given culture. Characters like Electra and well, Hamlet, who simply cannot accept our common fate as a species that every human being, every story comes to an end and even the best of us must die, seem more and also less than tragic. They may indeed seem simply unreasonable, even diluted. When we first la see Laodamia in my play, this is how her setting is described. Laodamia lives in a frozen chaos of her obsession. Perhaps it's a, a kind of wasp's nest made of newspaper clippings of war news and scraps of letters along with personal photographs and trinkets. But it should seem that she is living directly inside a fixation, an airless, lightless half-life that is part refuge, part open grave. In Laodamia's first scene, she meets the wife of Telefteus, whom I call Callisto. Rindi will play Callisto and I will play Laodamia. They trade stories of how they heard the news of their husband's death. Then Laodamia says, it doesn't matter how it comes, it's the same. No, it isn't. You've had less time to live in fear. And more time to live like this? Which of us can you say is like luckier? Oh, I don't know. I don't either. All I know is that I don't know how to live past this. Oh, you mourn. I can't. Don't believe it. Believe what? That he's dead. Oh, I know what you mean. It just doesn't no, seem- No, you don't. I mean that I don't believe it. I won't believe it. B but he is dead. Not as far as I'm concerned. I won't accept it until he comes to me himself to tell me that he's dead. But his death is exactly what makes his coming to tell you of it impossible. Until he comes, I won't accept it. He'll have to tell me himself. But that's insane. You can love your husband any way you want. This is the way I love mine. It's not about love, it's about the nature of things. You're being perverse. Perverse? Irrational. Why should I be rational? I don't pretend, I won't pretend this makes sense. It doesn't. To lose him like this and for what? A war in some country I'll never go to off at the end of things, some, some place I can't even imagine where he went to kill people he never knew, people he would never even have met anyway. And for what? Does that make sense? No, but- I refuse it. You refuse it. I don't even know what you think that means. And what does this refusal of yours do? I've made my demands. I have reason to hope. Why? You have no power, nothing to bargain with. I have my rights. No, you don't. It's the force of my despair. <sighs> Women, human beings, all human beings have always suffered like this. And worse, what makes you think you're special? I can feel it. Something is happening a shifting in the basement of things, little creaks and sighs, something is giving way. Oh, honey. He will come to me, I know it. 
I hope you're wrong for your sake. God, I hope you're wrong. A sound, both of them look down. End of scene. But of course, Laudamia and Mercury will meet. When he first arrives, he assumes that it's to loop a gray ribbon around her wrist and lead Laudamia down to the underworld and her death. But she says, no, she wants him to bring her husband back, which Mercury flatly refuses. She insists saying, I thought you could make an exception if you wanted to. Oh dear, this again. Just this once and we would be so grateful. I don't think you would. Really? No, but I would be. I would, I would never stop singing hymns to you. <laughs> I don't need hymns. <sighs> You're so maddening, you people. Me and Protosilaeus? No, people, 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 people. All the same endless craving and whining and resistance to the inevitable, not to mention the absolute certainty that you are somehow unique, each one of you, that what you ask me for has never been requested when you have never stopped asking for it from the beginning. Which is? Please, please let me go back just once for a moment. Now I know what I've lost. If I could feel it again, life, if I could only, or just give him back to me. It doesn't have to be for long, just time enough to see his face, tell him that I really, truly, and so forth. But we are unique, each of us. Our stories differ in detail after detail and each tiny difference determines the people we become. A chance encounter on the street, a missed train, a dropped glove, a moth bangs against a window and makes you turn your head and suddenly the whole course of a life shifts. And oh, if you could only understand because each one of us looks back at this long skein of random events, but it adds up to something that seems monumental as if it couldn't be any other way and at the same time wonderfully fragile and, and yours. For, for instance, he and I, how we first met and the way we loved each other. Oh, please don't. I've heard it. Your great human devotion to the differences between you. How every one of you is distinct. When all I see is how you share the same limitation, time, which is why you all seem alike to me. If you could only see yourselves from where I stand, each one of you, only one little fizzle of a candle apiece to light and burn and never to the end, out, out, the candles out before you've even been able to pierce the darkness of the tiny room you've tried to see with it. But as these long centuries of death have rolled past, I have stood on a mountain and watched forests burning below me. That is how much human life I have seen wear out its flames. And yet you have noticed me. Well, there's a, there's a kind of keening you can hear sometimes above the roar if you listen for it. I do, and yours has been hard to miss. It's the size of my sorrow. <sighs> Human sadness, that's the strangest thing for us and impossible for us to understand because we gods don't lose anything. We aren't built for that. Whereas it's all you people do. From the moment of your birth, you begin scattering your possessions like so much seed, baby teeth, innocence, hopscotch, pebbles, right up until the moment of your death, when you abandon pulse, sky, color, music, life, life, life. I can see it coming off you like steam as I take you down the path, so that by the time we are standing together by the river, waiting for the ferryman, there's nothing left to distinguish you at all. By then, all your little whiffs of exception and idiosyncrasy have danced up into the nothingness and left you mute at last at the water's edge. Your long work of losing is finally done. There are losses that cannot be borne. And yet they are. 
or you decide that they can't be and I take you down a little sooner. That's all. I'm not ready to go down. I demand that he come up. I know. That's what's so peculiar about you. How unreasonable you have been and for how long. So I am exceptional after all. Only in your stubbornness. Well then, perhaps that gives me something to bargain with. <laughs> Believe me, you have nothing to bargain with. Then why are you still talking to me? I think you're curious. It must be monotonous for you, all that wheedling and lamentation. You must have wanted to see what would happen if you gave in just once. For one thing, it's not my place. But you could do it, couldn't you? S say it's an experiment, just to satisfy your own curiosity. It could be a little secret, little transaction with the darkness. No one would have to know ever, just us, the three of us. And then you would have found something out. Uh, what would that be? What happens when you actually give human beings what they want? What they think they want. I know what I want, and I will never want anything more. Oh, I think you will before we are done. I can do something odd for you. I knew it. I knew you could. You, you will give it back. No, that's not in my power. What then? I can lend him to you. Lend him to me. For a few minutes, not more than that. That's all? Well, that's more than all the countless souls who have ever lived have ever had in the history of mankind. I'll take it, I'll take it. Whatever of him you can give me, please. Wait. He exits. She stands there in absolute stillness, waiting. Once both Laudemia above ground and Protosoleus below begin to sense that this unprecedented exception is in the works, they each have conversations with their counterparts, Laudemia with Callisto and Protosoleus with Talefteos. Laudemia makes this gesture. Callisto asks, What's that? It was our signal when we were thinking about the good times that we remembered. We did it when we could see, but we couldn't touch each other for some reason. Like when he was on the boat leaving for the war and I was standing on the shore, we could see each other. It's the last thing I saw him do. When I do it now, I think he can feel it. Well, we should have come up with something like that. I do it all the time. Simultaneously in Hades, Protosoleus is speaking to Telefteos. Telefteos says, it, if you see my wife, could you tell her to give my wife a message? Tell her that when her nose itches, that means I'm thinking of her. Her nose? I used to make fun of her the way she'd always have to scratch her nose when her hands were full or wet or, and she'd ask me to do it. Tell her that's when I'm thinking about her. Her nose, right. Yeah, you won't remember. After which above ground, Callisto says, so I've been thinking, do me a favor. If you see him, I want you to tell him to give my husband a message. Tell him that when I'm thinking about him, I always remember the night when we made love in a field and all the fireflies were out. That when he, that when he closes his eyes and sees them, that means I'm thinking of him. Got it? Fireflies, right. You won't remember. Suddenly, a great shaft of light penetrates into the underworld. It's like an incredibly intense follow spot, narrow and brilliant white. It searches around the darkness until it finds Protosoleus and then stops on him, completely still and vertical. A gray ribbon falls down to him from above. It is looped at the bottom. He places it around his wrist. Suddenly, his hand is jerked directly up, blackout. The next scenes are the center of my play and must have been the center of Euripides as well because they involve the meeting between the dead Protosoleus and Laudemia, which is to say the conversation that provokes the imagination of any playwright and the curiosity of any audience. This is how it happens in mine. Sound, Laudemia stands apprehensive. Suddenly Protosoleus is there looking disoriented. The long gray silk ribbon stays attached to his wrist, limply extending off stage. Laudemia gasps and runs to him. Carefully, she puts a hand out to him, touches him. They are both amazed to find that he is real and that they can touch. He lifts his hand, looking at it. 
places it on her face. She weeps. They kiss carefully. How long? I don't know. Not long. You're so pale, so cold. I've forgotten the sun. Your eyes, too. Blinding. They kiss. This fairy body here with me. This is where I used to live. And here, and here, and here. And I, and I, and I. Look at you, you're still intact. Intact? Whatever comes, age is something that will never come to you. Whatever comes, nothing comes to me now. Nothing will ever come to me. I will come. No, not you, my love. At best, an echo, a sort of snapshot. But we will be together. Not the way you think. Death is, it, it's only made up of what it isn't, which is life. That's all it is, death, not life. But we will be together. I, I don't know what you think that means, but you don't understand. We'll never be able to touch, not there. The body, it's only here, only here. Well then, she touches him. How much longer? The time, the time, the time. They embrace, the rolling time. across the space. Darkness lights up. They're sitting on the floor, cross-legged. She holds his wrist. Pulse? No. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yes. No, that, that's yours. I can feel yours in your fingers. No, it can't be just me. It, it, it's not my pulse, I feel. It's, it's time passing. I haven't felt it in so long. I haven't felt it since I heard about you. Time, that's when it stopped, not until now. It's terrible. Remember? Stop. Stop. They embrace. They try not to pat each other's bodies in the same beat, but finally end up doing just that, holding on to each other and patting each other in time to a heartbeat. Darkness. Lights up. You talk as if my death was a choice between love and honor, between you and, and, and some abstract, some other, some them. But that's what it was. No, that's not what it seemed like at the time. But that's what you did. You chose. You left me for what, that. War? For death. You chose death. How do you explain that? I, I can't. No. Because you think I don't, I can't understand? Yes. Well, you can probably understand, but it would be intellectual. How could anything I understand about you be intellectual? Everything I know about you, anything I really know when it comes to you. Is... It wasn't personal. It's personal. Everything about this is personal. It wasn't at the time. It should have been. All right, let me, let me try to say this. It had meaning for me, that death. Violence is inevitable. So war is inevitable. And if war is inevitable, then- To say something is inevitable is to make it just that. But death is inevitable. Apparently not. Yes. And this is how you want to spend this time. No, 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 no. They embrace darkness. Lights up. But it will happen, your death. And then it will be forever. What isn't forever is this, the ordinary sweetness of ticking time. It's what I've missed most of all, change, variation and surprise and sunlight and shadow, the sense of the world, everything in it, all things being in progress somewhere. Yes, and for me, it's been like living in the, on the deck of a ship, helplessly watching the life we once stood in together recede faster and faster into the distance as I pull away from that beloved shore. But you should, you can do that. Go on to become an old woman, live out the span of what you've, you have ahead, years and years of your particular life. All the mornings and evenings, rainstorms and sunny days that are there, still all there ahead, waiting for you, 
I'm touched. But you will always be this. Don't you understand that if I, that I don't want to get old if you don't? Every step I take into time takes further from you. Do it for the stories. Death is long. It's an endless now. And you would have more stories to tell me in it. Suddenly the ribbon attached to his wrist goes, starts to go taut. They watch, the ribbon pulls him to his feet. She hangs on to him. I'm coming with you. No, stay, get old. He's pulled away, she lets him go. For one moment more, he stands across the stage from her, pats his chest three times. She does the same on hers. He's pulled off, she collapses. What follows is a scene in which Laudemia above ground and Protosoleus in the underworld are grilled by their counterparts about whether they delivered the messages to their spouses about the ways they would know if they were thinking of each other. Both say they forgot to make that communication. On being asked how the return to life went, both Laudemia and Protosoleus have difficulty saying why it was so painful and end up saying merely, Now, all I can feel, all I can feel, all, All I, I can, can feel, feel is regret for what I didn't see, for what I didn't, what see, I didn't feel, what I didn't, what feel, I didn't do what I didn't when, do, I, had when I had the chance. There follows a scene in which Laudamia summons Mercury to say that she wants to go to the underworld. She says, didn't work. Well, what do you, did you expect? What would it working have meant? It would have fixed the, the error. It would have felt, it would have made sense. I knew this. I told you. I, I would have been able to live with it, accept it. That's what I thought. That if I saw him just once, even for an hour, but instead it's even worse now. The, the crush of this sorrow, the sense of living inside a, a mistake. A mistake that you think your death can solve. I know it can't be solved, but this pain. The pain will just follow you down. You won't escape it, even there. You just shift it from one pocket to the other. But at least there will be no more sunlight on it. She's already taken poison. After her death, she lifts her wrist, tie, ties a gray ribbon around it, and he leads her off. In the following scene, Callisto is in a sunlit place, kneading bread dough. Protosileus and Telepteus are together in the underworld. Laudamia is standing in a transitional place. She says, I've seen it in my head so many times. I will hear the ferryman's muttering song down the river, the tuneless tune he sings to himself as he makes his way through the fog. And then he'll be in sight, plunging his long pole into the silt of the river bottom. When he sees me standing there, he won't question me. He will know. He's seen it before. The girls with the bruises on their necks from the ropes they trail behind them. The wet tangled hair of the ones who drowned themselves and then us. The wasted eyes and waxy skin of the self poisoners. All the sad girls who've waited for him there as if waiting for their lovers to come out of the mist. He will put a hand out to me without a word and I will step into the gently rocking boat. And as he pushes off from the one shore, I will turn my face to the fog and listen to the silence as we make our way across the dim water to the last. Laudemia walks into the underworld. Her feet are bare and wet. The looped ribbon of silk falls off her wrist as she enters. The men look up and see her. I can't. I know. She sits down near them, pause. Protosoleus pats the top of his chest three times, looking at her. She pats the top of her chest three times in response. Then they look out. Telephtaeus looks up. Callisto suddenly looks up and out. She stops kneading the dough. She rubs her nose with the back of her hand. It's awkward because she has dough on her hands. Telephtaeus closes his eyes. Callisto laughs to herself. Telephtaeus smiles. Telephtaeus says, huh, fireflies. Protosileus and Laudamia look out and then up. 
Protosileus pats the top of his chest three times. Laudemia pats the top of her chest three times. They are all three looking up now. Callisto continues to knead her dough, smiling. Protosileus pats the top of his chest three times. Laudemia pats the top of her chest three times. Lights begin to fade. Protosileus pats the top of his chest three times. Laudemia pats the top of her chest three times. Darkness, in which we hear Protosileus pat the top of his chest three times. Laudemia pats the top of her chest three times. End of play. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be just looking for, uh, let's see if anybody among us here in, in House A has any comments, questions. And Ali, you can prompt me if there are any questions. Not yet. <laughs> Sorry for all the glitches, everybody. Thanks for hanging on. All right. I mean, maybe this is a good time for me to say how much, how wonderful it's been to be here and to be in the company of all of you scholars and to get a sense of what your life of scholarship is about as classicists. And really enjoyed it. Hi, Tim. Um, could I ask just a, as a general question <laughs> following from that to what ex Obviously, you've been looking at the fragments in the in the editions and, and the plays. To what extent do you find yourself looking at scholarship of the on, on Greek tragedy as part of the process of thinking about what you are, well, what you want to do? Doing both, yeah. That's the only way that you can make sense of them. After all, is to read them, the fragments in relationship to any scholarship that there is about them, but. You know, it's, there's, there's, there's some, and one, one of the great books that I've been able to read here involves Helena Foley's <clears throat> essay about heterosexual relationships in, with female characters in the fragments. And it's called, I think it's a book, if you know, I'm sure that others can uh, correct me on this, but it's called Female Characters in the Fragments. So ancient drama. It's a beautiful book that involves several essays and commentary on female characters in, uh, in the fragments. Do we have or, Laura? Yeah, you see. Laura? Am I, am I audible? You are. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, I mean, really, I'm just raising my hand to you know, see if you'll come and do this in my class next. Yes, I just want you to put this on the calendar. I'm going to have Bridget too. But I guess one thing I was wondering was, I mean, Rindy, is does this have echoes of Orpheus for you? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I wondered how, you know, whether that came into your your sort of collaborative thinking about. Yeah, people should know that Rindy Eckert, among many other things, is a writer and composer, wrote a version of music theater version of the Eurydice story, the Orpheus story <clears throat> called Orpheus X that was performed all over the world. Yeah, this trope, this trope of, of the, uh, you know, that Ellen uses here is, of course, the Orpheus Eurydice myth in kind of a different, reversed in a way. In mine, Eurydice doesn't is is a beat poet who actually has more or less committed suicide and and doesn't want to actually come back. So so she fights to actually stay and. In fact, attacks 
Orpheus when uh, he tries to lead her back. He wants, she insists on being seen, which is, I, I thought, a really interesting way to look at it. That she wants to be seen. We just yesterday had, <laughs> we met with our friend Sarah Rule, who wrote an extraordinary play called Eurydice that was then turned into an opera that was performed at the Met <clears throat> in the winter. And uh, we, we spent a lot of time talking about this idea of why does he turn? But I, I do sort of, my feeling is that there is this great uneasiness in ancient literature and of course now with the idea of a return from the dead. Um, that even if you can pull it off, it's never really a good idea. And that's sort of, that is what the end of uh, Thornton Wilder's Our Town involves, is the idea that a woman who dies thinks that what she wants is to return to life and uh, experience it all again. She's, she's unnerved by the, the sort of gray nothingness of, her life after death and, and she returns very briefly. She can go back to any moment in her life. She's warned against doing this, but she decides to go back to an ordinary day, her 16th birthday. And she returns to this little, you know, New Hampshire town in the early part of the 20th century and within minutes, she realizes what a terrible mistake that was because she realizes that she is only made fully aware of how much she didn't take in, how much she, of life she missed. And that is irre, irre, irrecoverable. I mean, she, she demands to be taken back to death. And I think that there's an aspect of that that, that comes into my version as well. So we have another hand up. See. That looks Bridget. like Sheila Mernigan. Hi. Oh, thank you. That was terrific. I was very, very struck by the quality of the dialogue, which had the most amazing combination of poignancy and wit and sounded so, so authentic. And it made me wonder about the difference between having the space of a fragment to really imagine the dialogue completely on your own and the experience you've had so often of adapting a fully written play, a fully surviving play in which the dialogue is given to you by the ancient author and then you're adapting it. And I just, I wondered if you had anything to say about the difference between those two experiences. Yes, well, I mean, the fragment, because it is so, so, it's such a shard of the protosoleus, really all I, I had to, to work with was the myth and I could make of it what I wanted, but I used the bones of the myth as being the sort of organizing principle. And yeah, it's an entirely different experience, but I, I've written many adaptations at this point of Greek sources, and I think it's 14 at this point. And each adaptation is really different from others. I mean, it, depending on what the theater commissioning me wants and what the experience is. For instance, when I, when I adapted Aeschylus' The Persians, I had to do it very, very quickly. And it was because it was a response by the National Theater, of, um, the National Actors Theater. I don't know, is that right? <laughs> anyway, it's a theater that no longer exists in New York. And it was run by Tony Randall, who was a great old lefty. And when, when the war in Iraq began in 2003, he decided that it was a national emergency. And he, he canceled his entire spring season and he said the only play that we should do as Americans at this time is the Persians. And it was a really gutsy move and unprecedented in my experience. And he hired the director, Ethan McSweeney, and Ethan started reading through all of the translations. 
of uh, the play and he thought this isn't going to work it's just it's too inaccessible and he called me up and he basically said how fast can you write and I thought well I don't know the play so I really have to spend some time with it but he said, we're going into auditions, which is a basically about a week long process. Right now, we're going in tomorrow into auditions and we will need a script as soon as you can get it to us. So I basically didn't do anything but read all the translations that I could find and then put them away and then started writing because I don't want to you know, use somebody else's scholarship as, and sign my name to it. But, that was a much more sort of, it's a matter of really coming up with something that has a kind of modern vernacular power to it, but also is adheres quite, quite directly with the source. And I didn't have time, but I didn't have an inclination to take huge liberties with that play. Although I did give the Tasa quite a lot more to do as a character. And I brought her in at the end, which he couldn't because he only had the two actors. But anyway, which is very different from another, another adaptation that I wrote that was, for instance, an adaptation of Antigone. And really, it's quite possible that you wouldn't know that I was adapting that myth if you didn't know the myth which is really loose. And I said it in depression era in New York and it involves, you know, my versions of the characters and I turn them into Americans. So I, I, I feel depending on what the project is that there is a possibility of taking great liberties if that's what is called for the last big project that I did was an Aristaya that was performed here in, in DC at the Shakespeare Theater in 2019. And Michael Kahn came to me and he said, I want the three plays to be turned into one evening's work, three plays in one evening. So you'll have to do whatever that entails. He said, I need you to put the Iphigenia story into the beginning of the play because the sacrifice of Iphigenia because many people coming to this will be seeing these stories for the first time and they need to know what fuels Clytemnestra's murder of her husband. And he said, and I want you to figure out how in the world to do the humanities such that we understand the Furies as the Furies, but also as a chorus, and the chorus all need to be the same people through the three plays because we're putting them together. And that allowed me quite a lot of liberty, but I also felt a great desire to sort of live inside the grandeur and the structure of the Aeschylus because it is that's the, that trilogy is so magnificent and it seems like I really needed to uh, stand inside that big tall room. But every step of the way, I bring the script to Michael Kahn, who was the artistic director of the Shakespeare Theater and who had commissioned the piece because he was gonna direct it. It was the last thing that he directed in that theater. And he kept on saying, step further from the source, step further from the source, you know, trust that, you know, you're not doing a translation of this work. That's not what I asked you to do. You know, make it your own, but let it have the, the size and the ambition of the Eskimos, so. I wonder uh, just to what extent the, because the, the, cho the chorus in both the Persians and in the Oresteia are both very strong personalities within the work. And I wonder to what extent that kind of, kind of edges you toward the classic, uh, a more classical feel to it. Yeah, I mean, every adaptation that I've ever done, and I think this is true for anybody who's adapting these plays is the decision that you have to make fairly early on is what are you gonna do with the chorus? Because there are choruses in all of these plays and they are an element which is 
fundamentally of the ancient world and, and not of our world. And so if you decide that you're going to use the cores, you want to use them. You want to really give them a vital role, which is what they have sources. And that can be, they can be, I mean, in the, in the case of the Persians, the chorus really are the, the primary actors of the play. They are what the play, you see the event of the play on them rather than so much on the principal characters. And that's true. The, the, I, I've done an Oedipus and the relationship between the chorus and Oedipus in that play, I think is an absolutely crucial love story that you have to honor in, the, in, the, in any adaptation. Okay. Yeah. So we have a, oh, is, Kim, Tim, do you have a question? Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, but the, but the, else. Oh, okay, there's, there's just one from YouTube, but I have not You go ahead and then we'll, I'll, I'll um, use this one. Could I, uh, your, your talk of, you know, there's, there's this interest in Hades mythology. And if one thinks at the moment of things like Hades town or of the use of the Orpheus Eurydice myth in something like the film, the portrait of the lady on fire, for example, now this is obviously a very universal theme, but is, do you have any thoughts of why this kind of Hades mythology has been so popular just in, in recent years? Is this a particular kind of, moment for such stories yeah i don't know that's a good question i i would be interested to see if anybody out there or in the room has any thoughts on that i don't know why this moment we seem to be particularly fascinated as a, it's, it's in the zeitgeist but i do think that it runs through that i mean it, it's a strain of, of content that has run through the whole, you know, civilization. <laughs> I mean, I think we are fascinated and that sense of what is death and what are the rules. When I, I might say something about that, I think there's something in the Orpheus myth in particular that is very that is, has a cogency today in, in that we are in a, in a moment of critical negotiation with nature. And, and, and Orpheus is a figure that stands in a relationship to nature and you know, Apollo and Dionysus in, 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 and it, he has one foot in nature which he has a rapprochement with. He, you know, the, he, he knows nature. He, he can hear nature talk to him, but he's also Apollonian. He's got that higher, that higher witness too. And he, he, he spans the two. And it seems to me that that moment of trying to recover Eurydice is a violation of his contract with nature. And in, to, to my uh, mind, that's when the main ads turn against him is because he's now violated the contract with, uh, with that part of his nature. And, and I feel like at the moment, we're trying to figure that out To yeah. We have violated our contract with nature and we need to repair that. And so I think the Orpheus myth in particular is a, a, I think maybe there's some mythic resonance that's at work there. Okay, so, so have... the question for, from our digital audience is from Josh Streeter. He says, thank you for this reading. Here's a question I have, which is the focus of my PhD dissertation. What similarities and what differences do you see about creating a tragedy and comedy from fragments? Well, yeah, I've done one comedy only, which was the Lysistrata. And again, I wrote that very quickly because it was in response to a political moment. It was the ramp up to the Gulf War in uh, 2003. There was this extraordinary thing called the Lysistrata Project, which was started by two out of work actors in New York who decided that they were going to do readings of Lysistrata on different parts. It, 
different parts of the country in March 3rd, 2003. And they put up a website and it got hit after hit after hit. And then thousands became millions of people deciding to do readings of Les Estrada at, on March 3rd. And there were readings in New York and they asked me to write an adaptation of Les Estrada so that it was something funny, quick and politically charged. And so I wrote that again, very, very quickly. And uh, yeah, I mean, I like to think that there are a couple of yucks in this one. And I try to put some comment, comedy into, I was, at least some leavening of the tragedy into anything that I do. But I think that the, the, the challenge of writing comedy turning particularly the Aristophanes comedies, which are the only ones I know particularly well, it's a challenge because I think comedy ages much more quickly and becomes uh, cryptic for us in a way that the tragic plays do not. We, there is a real, we can relate, we can understand the size and the moves of tragic playwrights in a way that Comedy is of the moment. Comedy is, it's tied to political moments. It's tied to political figures. You know, you make fun of specific people generally in comedy and it has a vernacular quality that the tragedies are, are there's a heightened quality to the language that transcends. So, I find, I mean, I, as they always say, comedy is hard, and I think it can be harder than the tragic. It's, it's harder to get it right to hit that tone, and it's harder to get it right in such a way that it, it resonates in all languages, because I'm reading these things in English translation, for instance. But the Les Estrada project was interesting because it was done on every continent in the world. There were hundreds upon thousands of readings of Les Estrada on that day. The day began in Australia and moved through the world. And there's a wonderful uh, documentary in which the little snippets of productions of Les Estrada from all over the world, that one. So it was an extraordinary event and absolutely unprecedented. Nothing like it had ever happened before as a, like a political protest that included the entirety of the world. So it's pretty great. I'm, I'm just reminded of some observation of a friend, I can't remember who, a long time ago, who was trying to talk to me about two different kinds of comedy. And he was comparing Marcel Marceau, the, the classic kind of mime, with Charlie Chaplin, and he was saying, well, Marceau takes the abstract and makes it trivial. And he said, and Chaplin takes the trivial and makes it grand. So it's, you know, you can take the, take the grand and make it into an object and trivializes it. Whereas he can take a couple of buns and make it timeless. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that's, that's, That's two different kinds of comedy, and hopefully, I do. You know, hopefully, we're more in <laughs> Charlie Chaplin's the world. Where... Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, wonderful. We have a very one more question from here from the room, Sofia Buzaki. I was just actually a quick question. You have been asked earlier. You know, when you write the text, uh, how do you? related to scholarship or something. My question is when you write, to what extent do you already visualize how it will be on stage? You already do, you know, you say they look up or something else. So my first question is how do you visualize? And then very specifically, how do you visualize Hades, the unthinkable? And how do you visualize the boundary, which is not a permeable boundary? So. Do you already imagine this? And does that then color the way you write? 
I think that that's, that's this murky area of the creative process that where I've spent sometimes weeks, sometimes months inside that moment of transition before I feel like I've found an image that works for me. And I try a few things out and they just don't quite work. But by the time I realized that 80s for me would be a matter of people walk on with their feet and their feet are wet and there's a sense of gray and the 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 idea the device of the ribbon the gray ribbon around the the wrist of the dead as they and as they come into Hades the ribbon falls off the wrist and that it's by a ribbon a gray ribbon that Hermes, who I always associate with the color silver gray, leads us down. That once I had just sort of one notion of a kind of, that, that was economical and had a dream logic to it, then I thought, oh, okay, I can do this. But until you have that one, at least one image, one theatrical image, I find it's impossible to write anything because I can't, I can't enter into my own world. And for instance, with the Antigone adaptation, I spent a year just not being able to come up with something that I thought was an image that was mine, that was idiosyncratic, that had a dream logic, a theatrical logic to it, something that could be accomplished and visualized that didn't need a whole lot of, you know, it didn't need movie magic. It needs to be, in the theater, we only deal in metaphor because anything that you put on a stage has been chosen is, is you make a decision to put that thing on the stage. And so, and everything, we, we only deal in what's implicit. We, we deal with the idea that the audience comes and does half the work because they have to do a fair amount of imagining. And of course, today you had to do quite a lot of imagining because we're imagining the stage direct. I mean, it's a lot to ask to have you actually understand what we're doing. But until I, I finally came up with one image for the Antigone, which was a woman lying on the floor and listening to the floor and tapping Morse code on the floor, trying to communicate with her father. And I thought, oh, okay, now I can write the play. <laughs> and I saw her in a house dress from the 30s and I thought, oh, she's American and it's the 30s. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll just go with that. Mm. You have to view these things as gifts that finally just drop in. But until they come, it's pretty nerve wracking. <laughs> I'd like to add that I think that Hades in particular and the theater share a lot. Yeah. <laughs> There's a kind of uh, liminal space uh, that the theater stage. represents. It's an empty stage. It's a limbo, if you will. And I think that, that it's, an, it's an easy place for a theater to be drawn in that a way. That may be you know, part of the reason that, yeah. that these things are coming up. I, yeah, it's a, it's a place where something has to happen, but it's also, it's an endless now. Yeah, that's what the theater One thing's stage. One Beckett, is. and uh, yeah, I mean Beckett got it right Godot. as he got everything right, mm -hmm. but it is he was very clear on the fact that you can't do Waiting for Godot in some sort of elaborate place. It's a stage. That's the point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yes. uh, and if you try to fancy it up and do lots of scenery you're missing the point. It's a stage. That's the hell of it. And that's the beauty of it. Yes. Yes. I think, thank you so much. I feel that this actually, in a way, closes a beautiful, the, the image, <laughs> the image of, of today. And thank you truly for transporting us, bringing us into this space and, and sharing so much about the process as well. We're just so honored. And we thank everybody for joining us today. And I hope that we all continue 
um, this conversation, but thank you. Thank you, thank you. so much. Wendy, thank you so much for joining us. This is Happy just uh, marvelous. We thank you all again very much for being with us in this program, and we hope uh, that we stay in touch as, and, and hopefully we'll see more and more productions and work that of yours. Be great. So with that, I will greet you. Goodbye.